electric utility co-op. And we were introduced to CHIP through the Island Institute. And you may remember last November at the Island Institute's uh, energy conference in Portland, they gave Block Island an award for our work that we've done on supporting the offshore cable. Um, CHIP's uh, co-op is, is, utility is very similar to ours. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to CHIP and let him uh, give you a little bit of overview of what his utility looks like. Um, we've given him some questions that we'd like to have answered. And please feel free to open up um, and ask questions anytime you want. This is a, a learning process for us. And it's an important process that we need to go through. So with that, Chip, welcome. Sure. Well, hello. Beautiful day to come here. Um, and uh, another boat ride somewhere else. <laughs> it's, it's different. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself, just very, very short. To, uh, and and, and uh, I, 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 when I got out of college, I went into public accounting, and I got involved in auditing um, co-ops, California electric co-ops all over New England. Um, and after that, I went to work for one. And then I ended up working for a very large um, investor in utility called Arthur Rockland Utilities in, in uh, New York, southern New York State. And I was, a, I was a, uh, we were doing management aud audits, uh, financial and management audits, which was a new thing at the time. And instead of just looking at numbers, you'd go out and look at operations and evaluate them. And, and uh, for example, uh, you know, the efficiency of purchasing and things like that. And then I got the urge to go to live in Vermont. My brother was a legal aid lawyer. He went to work for Vermont Legal Aid, and I wanted to get out of Southern New York. So I went to work for the city of Burlington, Vermont, as the controller of their electric department. So publicly, uh, utility. And then I went to Boston for a little bit to work as a consultant. And, and, uh, and uh, after a short time, I went back to Vermont. And I ran uh, an entity called the Vermont Electric Co-op. And they had a subsidiary called the Vermont Electric Generation Transmission Co-op. And they had purchased uh, about 50 million. It was a very, it was a very, it was about 8,000 member co-op. And they, they had purchased about $50 million worth of nuclear power. Any, anywhere you could buy it, they would buy it. You know, the millstones, the pilgrims, the sea brooks. And, and they were on the skids. They, they, they couldn't. The regulators wouldn't let them increase the rates because the investments were imprudent. And, and, and they signed contracts for even more Seabrook. Sea broke. They borrowed a lot of this $50 million. They built a hydro site, which was a $20 million, 4 megawatt run the river hydro, which is just right through the ceiling. One of my first, one of my first projects was to evaluate that hydro project. And, and the board thought it was going to cost $8 million, and it was up to $20 million. So I didn't know, I didn't know whether I was going to be employed much longer after that presentation, but someone said, don't shoot the messenger. But I spent about 12 years um, <clears throat> putting that co-op back together, um, getting it out from underneath the federal loans. And they had, they had, they had straight voltage problems. They had vendor lawsuits. Um, the, the system was a mess. Um, and basically, the scheme was that they were going to buy a whole bunch of nuclear capacity Two cents, and then they were going to sell it for ten cents. So they bought they bought this capacity way beyond what the members ever needed, and to put the risk on the members' back. Unfortunately, and we all know what happened to nuclear power. It, it cost fifteen cents, and the market was two cents when it, when any of it did go into uh, operation. So we, we put the um, it was a fascinating process because um, I met all these politicians. I testified. I met in the New York Times and. and, and 60 minutes, and, and uh, CBS came up and filmed us all on one day. And it got quite a bit of media attention. And in Vermont, you can't do much without media attention. They follow you around, and, and it's a very small place. We ended up um, in, in, in the federal bankruptcy court. We got a lot of the stuff resolved. We sued Seabrook uh, for a prudency issue, prevailed at that. But we got, we got down to the federal loans, and, and um, the, uh, the Rural Utility Service just wouldn't figure it, forgive enough debt to, to please the regulators. So we were in between the, the, the regulatory, the regulators in Vermont and the federal government. So we ended up in Chapter 11 uh, with the co-op, and the, the, the G&T entity was in Chapter 7. And, and we got out of it. Um, 
the, the law clerk in the federal bankruptcy court said they should put this, 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 uh, this case in the textbooks because he said, I'm so impressed. I had a really great law firm because those of you, the, law, the, the lawyers were just absolutely terrific. <coughs> and after that, I ha actually, what happened is um, when, you, when you default on the federal debt, um, the Justice Department steps in as their attorneys to represent the RUS. And at the end of it, they had to take a very significant hit, about $50 million. And, um, and one of the things they wanted is that if, if, if they had to take that kind of hit, they would settle the case, but they wanted me to, to resign. That was their vindication. So I said, sure. And, and um, so I went into the natural gas business as CF, chief financial officer of the natural gas business in Burlington, Vermont, which is owned by Gas Met in, in Montreal, which is a fairly large natural gas business. Did that for about uh, 10 years. And, and my wife and I decided, we lived in Vermont at the time, we decided that we just wanted to spend more time together and you know, slow down. And I was working 12 hour days. So we saw this ad in, in some, some uh, paper that the Fox Sounds Electric Co op was looking for someone to train um, somebody to be the manager. So we packed up and got on the boat and went over and, and met the board. And um, they hired me. And then the guy that wanted it, I was interested in being trained, didn't want to be trained anymore. And um, so the board asked me to stay. And about two years into it, uh, we decided to put up a, a three turbine, uh, a wind farm with three turbines, one and a half megawatt turbines, which, uh, and uh, we found a guy who's a Harvard Business School teacher, his name is George Baker, to help us. Um, it's a really big undertaking to do something like that, particularly on an island. So, so he was just just really a uh, really very bright guy, uh, and, and um, so it, it got very, very interesting in doing the project and everything. And then we got into problems with some sound issues with, uh, with people that were around in and around the project. And, um, and we finally, uh, last May, prevailed at the uh, Maine State Superior Court. Uh, just something we decided a case that had been being litigated for four years in our favor. Um, and so far, so far, so good. The project's operating as it should. The prices have come down because the litigation's cost has come down. And we spent an awful lot of money on the litigation and the regulatory process to get through it to, to bring it to where it's supposed to be. So that said, that's, that's my, my, uh, my, my career track. And, um, and we're still there. We've been there for, um, for nine years, almost 10 years, and, and we live in Vermont, and we go back and forth um, from Vinyl Haven, Vermont. We try to go every two weeks, but sometimes we'll spend a month there, whatever you know, whatever the job requires. The board's been really, really good to me about that, so um, so, so we, we just um, we do go back and forth. Our co-op um, has uh, 17, uh, 1,700 customers. Um, we have about 2,000 meters. Uh, and a lot of people have more than one meter. Um, a lot of people have uh, fish houses and you know uh, workshops and things like that. So there's more than multiple meters under one person's name. Um, we have uh, our, our peak demand is about oh, I would say 2,400 kW. Uh, the population is about fivefold higher than, than in the summer than, than it is in the winter. There's about 300 customers, uh, members on North Haven in the winter, and about 1,200 uh, uh, winter customers on, on, on Vital Haven in the winter. And that in the summer um, implodes into, into 4,000 on Vital Haven, and I think maybe 1,200 on, on North Haven. Um, we have, we have eight employees. Um, we have four linemen, and we have four people, including myself, that work in the office. Uh, and we have a, we have a co-op board of uh, nine members uh, who were elected. And, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, the co-op was created in 1975. And the, the, the process there was um, the, the, the co-op was formed in, in 1975. They went to Washington. Uh, to get a loan to buy the Vinyl Haven light plant. And that was basically, they had diesel generators down in the center of town on the water, and, and the islands were supplied. There was no connection to the mainland. The islands were supplied power with these diesel generators. And, um, and they were, um, in those days, uh, the technology was not really reliable. Um, and um, and they, they, they call, I think I, 
I think I've heard people call it, it was like half and half or something. And uh, they would serve one island half a day, and you know, the Bible Haven island half a day. So it wasn't convenient. It wasn't convenient. Way to serve people. So they went to Washington and got a, 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 a loan from the Rural Electrification Administration, a 2% loan. They, they bought, uh, they bought the, the light plant, and then they also uh, 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 got sufficient funds to build a cable to the mainland. And so in 1975, uh, or a little bit later than that, they connected the co-op system on both islands to, to the mainland. And now they could buy their power from um, uh, uh, Central Maine Power, which is a large investor in utility. Um, so that was um, that was uh, something that was you know very very welcome um, uh, as compared to the system that they had and the liability issues. Um, that cable lasted about uh, the late the late 19, 1998 1999. They started having problems with the reliability of that cable, and as I, as you probably know, the tidal changes are very extreme um, in Maine, and also the, the bottom of the ocean is very rocky. So this, these were four single phase cables, um, and and they would move, and and with the rocks they would rub and, and they would fall. They would they would they would they would wear through the wire, and they have to shut the. They, they had four cables, so they could they have three energized and spare, so they could they could um, they could shut the damaged one off, you know, energize the spare, and then go out and barge and fix it. Well, as people were they, were they buried. What's that? Were they buried or just laying on top? They were just on top, yeah. They, 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 these guys were on top, right, right on top of the ocean. Were. And then it got so bad that um, you know one would fail, and then they go for the spare, and that one had failed. You know that one was damaged too. So in 2004, they set out to to put in a much modern, uh, more modern cable. And in 2005, um, they uh, put in a, a a single cable. And um, it's got three phases in it, um, uh, very, very well shielded around the outside. And then in, in, in the center of those fibers, 26 fibers. Um, that's a single cable. They, they, they brought it in a barge. And, and, um, and, and what they did is they also they blew um, and plowed um, a trench in, in, the, in the bottom of the, the, bottom of the sea floor and, and, and buried it. So it's buried, you know, probably, I'd say, maybe three to six feet as much as they could. <clears throat> and that one was energized in 2005. And um, that cable goes from, it's about 11 miles. It goes from, it goes from uh, a, a place called Lynn Cove. Um, it's, it's, it's connected um, way up off the coast um, to Central Maine Power. There's a, big, there's a big substation there. Central Maine Power comes down overhead, and then it goes. Um, it, it switches to underground, and it goes down underground uh, into, into the water. It comes over, and it comes up. It, it, it comes to a, a place called uh, a Crabtree Point on North Haven, and it goes through. We have a lot of cables. It, it goes through uh, a, 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 a vault, a big concrete vault, and then that single that single cable. Divides into three single, three phase, three three single cables, and then it goes over to Vinyl Haven, and then it goes up overhead and it goes to a substation, and, and that's where that's where the voltage is converted from transmission voltage to, you know, the, the voltage that customers need need, need to have. Um, so far, um, since 2005, we've had really good luck with with, with that cable. Um, the fiber, um, we've leased a couple of the fibers to Time Warner um, for, a pretty, for a pretty good revenue flow. And uh, I, think, I think in the long run there'll be more, more companies that are interested in doing that also. Uh, so um, that's the history of the cable. We, we did have that vault that converts the, the single cable to three single, fa single cables uh, caught, caught fire last April. Um, which was kind of traumatic, and, and um, uh, it's just like a big, when you open it's like a big barbecue, and you look down and you can see where the big cable comes in and then the three single cables go out. And, but we, um, but we, uh, we found the contractor who built it and got them up from Massachusetts and, and, um, and um, uh, rebuilt it and got it energized in about five days. 
<clears throat> we do have a um, when they when they put the cable in in 2005, they they purchased a, uh, a generator. Um, it's one of those. It's a caterpillar generator. It's one of those. They, they come in a big uh, like a truck, like a, like a you know like a moving truck, and it's a two megawatt generator, and um, it's hooked, it's hooked up to the system. And basically, um, what they can do is they can disconnect. They can disconnect the co the, the co-op from from the uh, the mainland right by it, and then they can energize. They can energize that uh, that caterpillar. Uh, and it's really, um, it's, 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 it's got two really um, positive benefits. One is that um, um, the, the, the power from Glen Cove, where our power starts to come from, uh, from CMP, is not 100% reliable. Um, I was sitting in my office one day, I think a year ago, and, and um, the lights went out. And people call, everybody's lights were out. And so the lineman went out and said, both islands are off. And uh, one of the towns to cross on the mainland is Thomaston. So somebody hit a telephone pole in Thomaston. And don't ask me how city to tell it's, it's, you know, it's, you go way across the ocean and then you go down about um, 10 miles from where you see and feeds us. And, but anyways, that's what happened. So the, the, the lineman we have can very quickly rush up there and, and, and energize to turn on the generator and, and it's fine, so it, serves. it burns a lot of oil. Um, it's expensive to run, but but, uh, but it's, it's 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 a lifesaver when when, uh, when we lose power from the main. It doesn't happen very often, but it's nice to have um, when it does. When we had this uh, ball problem of the fire, uh, we ran quite a bit when the repairs were being done because again that was our that was part of the, the main the main cable that provides us the electricity. The second benefit it has is that um, we found out that um, we can get a credit from ISO New England um, just by virtue of having having this generator as a backup. Um, so so people can buy the capacity, as I understand it. Uh, the companies can buy the capacity to to get credits for backup, and so they pay us um, they pay us right now about I think fifty fifty thousand dollars a year. Just to just to have it available, uh, we, we we haven't as of yet since I've been there um, have to have to turn it on for backup, but but we still get paid for it, uh, and we have to test it twice a year. Um, the guys go out and they phase it into the system, and um, and then you send a report to ISO New England, and then your your credit credit continues. Um, so that's that real value because I think they spent. Quarter of a million dollars when they when they initially bought bought it to to, uh, to 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 run it during the time that the new cable was being put in, laid on the ocean floor. So it's been giving us that credit for about oh, I've been there since eight years, and so we, we made you know uh, almost we made more than what the cable cost, uh, what the, the diesel generator cost. So so it's got value. It's got value with that too. So 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 it is a good thing to have. But it but it does. Um, the, 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 the two and a half days we ran it when the vault was being repaired, um, oh gosh, I can't remember how many gallons of oil and how much it was, but oil wasn't as cheap a year ago as it is today, so it's very, very expensive. Um, so that's, um, that's pretty much uh, the, 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 the history of it. Um, we did, we did uh, the wind project we have, um, as I said, is uh, three one and a half uh, megawatt turbines. They're pretty much right in the middle of the island on Vital Haven, um, and they they feed right into our right into our distribution system, and and uh, they generate. Um, we use um, as a whole the island uses as a whole about 10 million kilowatt hours a year for for, for all our customers, power <coughs> all our customers. The wind turbines generate about 10 or 11 million kilowatt hours a year, depending upon you know what kind of winds you have and. And um, and uh, unfortunately, it's not at the same time. Um, uh, and and uh, wind turbines uh, generate more in the winter than they do in the summer. Um, and uh, our loads are lower in the winter than they are in the summer. So it's a little bit of an opposite thing. But um, uh, fortunately, um, the history of pricing has been such that um, 
uh, you can sell more, you can sell power more uh, in Maine in Jan for more money in, May in, in January and February than you can in the summer. So, so, and, and that's when we have a lot of excess um, power from the turbines to sell. So, so we sell a lot in the winter, um, the shoulder months, April, May, and, and, and um, uh, mostly, uh, it's, it's, they, 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 we don't sell much, we use a lot of it on the, on the island. And then in the summer, um, we use a lot of the wind, wind power because it, it generates very little. So we're in the buy mode. And um, so we go to the isolator and spot market, and we buy um, fairly substantial amounts of power to serve our, serve our summer load. Um, but we have a little bit of a, we have a little bit of a natural hedge with these guys because um, we buy 40, the wind turbines, 60% of the wind turbine power stays on the island year round. 40% goes to the mainland and we have to buy 40%. So we're buying in the, you know, as much as we're selling. So we kind of have a hedge against the prices um, uh, because, because the sales and purchases are equal. Except we have a little advantage on the head because the prices are higher and we really sell more. But um, the, the the wind turbines um, uh, had uh, a little bit of a rough start because um, in Maine, um, as part of your siting, your, your, your siting permit requires that you um, have a protocol, an operating protocol for sound. And and um, let me first state that I I. I I haven't seen a wind project that hasn't had some sort of problems um, uh, with, with it, maybe you know with, from, with, with people from the public for either either um, during the construction phase or or, or or you know the phases they go through. Our our problem wasn't the construction phase. Um, I mean when they um, you can appreciate how difficult it is to build three 300 foot towers on the island to get to get everything out here. The crane was so large that they had to bring a crane in to put the crane up, the main crane up. Um, and everything came from the barges, and um, they come right in. Um, a lot of them came, uh, some, of, some of the stuff came into the center of town, and people would be down there clapping, and, you know. And, and um, so it was a very, it was a very um, uh, joyous, joyous process. And we hired uh, Chimro, who was a construction company from outside of Portland. They were just, they were just great. I can never say enough good things about them, how they, how they were on time, how they blended in with the community, how they told people what was going on. And um, so that part of it went smoothly. Unfortunately, when they started to generate electricity in November of uh, 2009, um, pe some people, a very small portion of the people, said they were loud. And, and uh, what, it, what I started to say is the Department of Environmental Protection Bank um, uh, uh, requires you to have a sound protocol, and there's there's things you have to do. There's um, they can run at 55 decibels during the day and 45 decibels at night, and and um, so we got into uh, to make a long story short, we got into four years of litigation. Um, the neighbors, the neighbors. There's about when I say neighbors, there's probably six six families um, uh, thought the protocol wasn't wasn't uh, strict enough. That, uh, that it should be stricter than what the DEP gave to us. So they challenged it to the Superior Court and prevailed. Um, the DEP and ourselves appealed it to the State Supreme Court, the Supreme Court and, and Supreme Court said our protocol was fine. We had one, one specific complaint that the whole case was about, and the Supreme Court said that, that, that it was handled properly. So that, happened, that decision came out in May of 14, so everything has been. Um, no pun intended. Quiet since then, but um, we spent a lot of money, um, and and uh, the DEP and the Attorney General spent a lot of time and effort, you know, getting to that point. Um, we were able to um, we were able to bring the cost back down. I have I have a graph that shows shows the cost from from the, you know from the from the operation date, and as the lit as, as the litigation um, got more and more active, the prices went up and up and up. And as the litigation went down, the prices went down. We also got a pretty good rec contract in, in that, in that you know, one of those stages. So now we're down to a little over, um, in the budget this year, oh, I would say for the cost of new power, a little over six cents a kilowatt hour. It went as high as uh, eight and a half cents, which is very expensive. 
That's not the whole bill. That's just the that's just the wood project. But um, but I think generally, you know, people in Vital Haven are are, are, are real happy with the project. Um, um, the, uh, the, uh, the during the litigation, um, the, 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 the the controversy got very nasty. Um, and um, uh, but uh, just people people said things that um, you know probably were inappropriate. And, and, uh, and um, but but so far it's been it's, it's it's I think it's I think it's headed back to a reasonable a reasonable thing. If, I, I think I think that I think that the, the opponents tried to portray that you know half the town was against it, and half the town was for it. Uh, it was ninety-seven percent of the town was for it, and six six or seven couples was against it. That's um, and and uh, and we, we, we tried. We, we we had we had two mediations um, during the Superior Court case, and 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 we weren't able to we weren't able to resolve our differences with the settlement. So you know the litigation went on. So um, the project worked fine. It came in at cost. It's generated exactly what um, um, you know the feasibility study said it would. Uh, and and, um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's fascinating. I, when I was in the natural gas business, you, could, you know you didn't talk about renewable energy because natural gas was the thing you wanted to sell. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was the dominant product. So. So uh, I can remember standing out there one night, and, and there was a guy trying to uh, fix the programming on the SCADA system, and it was snowing. And I was standing right between, right in the middle of the whole project, and, and um, it, you know, and to look up and see these blades going around and saying, you know, these these things are generating awful like enough uh, electricity to serve, you know, to serve these islands, and, and, and they're and they're in there. They're not totally harmless. I mean, people will argue that the concrete that you use. Um, to build the bases is, you know, an environmental hazard and all this stuff, and takes more energy than than, than these things generate. But but um, they're 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 pretty harmless, um, and, um, um, and 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 I I I I one now that thinks you know they're a very good idea. So we have those. Those have kept us busy. Our our linemen uh, went to the General Electric store and learned how to put the harnesses on and climb up and. They'll stand and they'll. I've got pictures of you know them standing on top of the cell, 300 feet in the air, you know, and <laughs> waving. Um, and, uh, and and they'll go up when it's six, if, if it's if it's 20 degrees on the ground, it's a lot colder up there if you have to go up there and work for for, for two or three hours. Fortunately, um, you know, not, uh, we don't have a lot of problems with it. We we did have one pinion bearing problem, which um, they had to bring a crane out and bring the gearbox down. But they did the whole thing in three days and. And that was it. That was the last thing that we, we had to deal with. And then, you know, frequently, frequently they'll, uh, they'll, uh, they'll, 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 vibration will shut them off, and, and they can't get them back on. The whole project is monitored by GE from Schenectady, so so they can turn them back on and off in, in most cases. But in some cases, the linemen have to go up and, and do it do it manually. So. So that's that's basically what what I'm about, and, and, and that's what the Fox Islands Electric Co-op. Uh, we did we did create a subsidiary when we built the when we built the wind farm, and, and we have a separate board for that, and, um, and we did it for um, for tax reasons to take advantage of the um, the renewable energy credits and all the all the tax benefits that are available for the uh, for renewable energy. <coughs> Yes. Uh, I have a question. You bought a generator uh, to be part of your program instead of using the diesel generators you already had. No, they were. Good question. They the diesel generators that were there in 1975 were gone. They when, when they they um, uh, just removed them. I think I think I think one of them ended up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> told me that. I don't know. No, that's correct. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. In the, in the uh, early 80s, it would have been. Yeah. One of your Fairbanks Morse, a uh, post piston reciprocating diesels came here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So they were gone. And, and you did that, you got rid of them thinking you would buy this Caterpillar generator instead? Or I no, no. We, we, in 1975, when, when the town fathers went to Washington, they got, they got a loan to buy. 
the, the system, the electrical system, from, from a private owner. And they also got sufficient money to put a cable in the ocean, which would go to the mainland, which would then be their, 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 their which then would provide them electricity <coughs> from the mainland. So they didn't need the generators anymore. So, the so second the second generator came in 19 uh, in 2005, and basically what they had to do when they put the new when they put the new cable in the underwater cable from the mainland, they had to cut the co-op off from from any elect from getting any electricity from the mainland. So they so they they bought this generator to to provide electricity for I don't know what it was maybe maybe a week. So you had no backup between... No, we did not. That's exactly right. Between about, about 1975 and 2005. And what did you do if you had an outage then? You well, we had, they, had, um, they had four cables, yeah. underwater oh, cables. That's what you were saying. So they had three energized, three phases energized, and they had a spare. That wasn't perfect, though, when it started failing. But, um, a lot of people have their own generators because of that phase of the co-op's life. They, you know, for, 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 for continuity or reliability, they went out and bought generators. It was a pretty tough time. I, I wasn't there. And then what happened is, um, some, uh, you know, electrical, underground, uh, undersea, underwater electric cables aren't cheap. So starting in 2005, um, they did get a they did get a uh, grant from the federal government, and but I think the whole the cost was about six or seven million for this new cable. 2005, so, so the rates went up, I would say, 35 or 40 percent to, to cover the cost of it. So what is, the, what is the total kilowatt cost in your system right now? Kilowatt hours in yeah, the mill? Yeah. It's, it's um, probably, I would say, probably 25, 26 cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. All, all inclusive. That includes then the time that the generator has to go on, whatever that is. Yes. Okay. It includes everything. Yep. It includes it includes integrating the wind farm power into it. It includes buying and selling to the mainland. It includes transmission costs from ISO and Central Maine. It includes um, it includes regulatory costs um, uh, for programs. You know, the legislature <coughs> puts together uh, and. Um, and it includes, in Maine, we call the transmission and distribution rate, and that's the that's the portion of the rate that um, you charge people to run the co-op, you know, to, to, to run the trucks, to pay the payroll and, and benefits and buy supplies and things like that. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm puzzled uh, uh, because I think what you've been telling us about is the engineering of the system, whether it's wind or generator or whatever. Uh -huh. But as far as I've understood it, and maybe I'm wrong. You're a cooperative, yes, which owns the whole process of engineering distribution and has to negotiate it with the various parts. I, Is think, that, I think so. What do, you, what do you mean by negotiating? The well, management? let me contrast it with for the way I've seen one of the difficulties we have here. Mm -hmm. Difficulty being quotes. It may be a good thing we have here, it may not be, I don't know. But we've got BIPCO, the power company, which is privately owned. We have um, a wind farm that's being set up by a privately owned yep. company. And we as a community own nothing. We are only advocates or hope people or whatever. So that we can ask for particular kinds of engineering <laughs> and pressurize for a cable other than a whatever, I mean, can ask for solar power as well as wind, but I can't get the... I see the... I, I can't the, uh, get where... Okay, we are... Where we, we, are, can, we, 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 are where we can have control of our problems. Yes, yeah, we, 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 we are, we are to, to the extent that, um, that uh, the company that I run yeah. um, owns the utility system. Yes. Um, and, and we also own the wind farm. Yes. Um, which is different. Yes. Um, however, we still have to we still have to negotiate um, with the power company on the mainland right. um, um, for yes. to, to, to to operate. Uh, we 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 are other than this little generator we have, we're pretty much reliable on them yeah. um, for for the power flow, um, which which goes smoothly. You know, it, mm -hmm. there's, there's 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 minimal problems um, and. Uh, and we we but we do have that control which which is different yeah. here I understand yes. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes ma'am. Given that we citizens do not own any of this hardware, 
What steps would you recommend for this island to take to be more successful in negotiating, help or helping negotiate or influence the negotiation of the upcoming main system so that we can avoid all kinds of litigation if possible? Yeah. Well, what do you want to achieve? <laughs> that's available, I think, is that, um, that uh, you know, as, as the town fathers in Vinylhaven did in 1975, they went to the privately owned um, uh, company that owned, owned all the, you know, the, 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 the utility on, on the islands and, uh, and offered to buy it. And their plan, their plan was, um, Similar to what I may, you know, their goal I think was similar to what your, your goal may be here, and that is, that is that um, they 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 wanted reliable power, and they wanted control over the over the uh, the quality of the power um, because the system was very run down, and 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 they had access um, and, and 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 by by um, creating a co-op. Uh, which which um, they could because they met the requirements the USDA has to do that. Um, they uh, they could get, they had access to low cost money so they did um, they did the whole the whole process in 1975 with two percent money. In fact, we're, we're just we're just working on off the <coughs> I forget how long those loans are. I think I think the initial loan for the cable has been paid off. We have one two percent loan now that's down to twenty thousand dollars. So they were allowed to borrow money for a while at two percent. Now, now, um, you know, really now for the last couple of years, um, that that set those same loans that you borrow, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, were probably three three percent. Um, so money, uh, you know, it's, it's starting to go up a little bit, I guess, but. Um, um, it's very, very inexpensive money. I made a point um, in the last five years um, because it's such an it's, it's such a it's such a perfect time to 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 rebuild our system. And our system had um, some reliability problems. The distribution system, you know, the, the ones you see on the streets that go to your houses, um, some of it was very old. We had poles that were you know 60, 50, 60 years old. You couldn't climb them. They blow down. They blow down when the wind would blow really hard. The wire was old, um, uh, and um, so we, uh, for North Haven, for example, the, the, the Northern Island, um, we put I think probably 1.2 million dollars into, um, and and uh, and um, you know, I mean you can just you can just tell by uh, you know watching the overtime hours um, and and you know and people's people's reactions um, when you talk about the co-op. That it really is, you know, significantly improved their liability, uh, and people have control. You know, people people can vote for their board members, um, and it's a very it's a very you know it's a, it's, it's a democratic process. So, did you keep the line above the ground when you uh, upgraded the system, or did you uh, put everything underground? Oh no, we, we we put it. It has to be above ground. Vinyl um, Haven more than North Haven, but both islands have a. Incredible amount of granite underneath. There's, 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 you know, and and we, we have something called a rock drill. So if you if we want to set a pole, we have to take a rock drill out and drill through the granite to get the pole in the ground. So the underground is very very difficult to to utilize. Uh, could you uh, say uh, uh, give us a little description of how the board works uh, and uh, uh, how the relationships are there? Can I ask you a quick question before that? Who are the members of the co-op? That everybody, everybody that takes service. When you come in, yeah, when you come in and you want electricity, you sign a membership card, and now, now you're part of the and you're yeah. member of the club. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, who are the the, 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 how does the board work? Yeah, how does the board work? Well, um, if you want to be a board member, um, you you uh, have to get a petition, so a petition with um, I think only 15 um, <coughs> signatures. Uh, there's a, there's a nominating committee. <coughs> 
So you give, your, you give your petition to the nominating committee, and every you have two-year terms, uh, and every two years um, you go through that process, and, and your name goes on a ballot, and um, uh, and you uh, you know you basically put your hat in the democratic democratic process, and and uh, uh, there's 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 actually two districts. North Haven is separate from Lionel Haven. So um, people in North Haven, there's three board members from North Haven and six from Vinyl Haven. And, and, uh, and the, the, the people uh, who are running, you know, the first person that gets the most amount of votes, I mean, Ryan wins. And if there's two slots in the second number, of high, the second highest number of votes wins. And, and, uh, and then you're on there for two terms. So basically, the, the potentially, um, the board could change every, every two years. It doesn't. People usually stay. Um, uh, and a lot of people, um, we, we just had a fellow, um, he moved to the mainland, uh, and, and uh, he was one of the original um, five from 1975 that went to Washington State, so he was on that board for a long time. Is there, are there term limits? No, there's not. Yeah, no? No. Okay. And what, what about the, uh, 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 what are the responsibilities of the board? The, the, the responsibility of the board is to is to uh, to, to set policy uh, and 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 hire a general manager and and oversee um, the general manager's uh, position. But they don't deal with day-to-day -day operation at all. That, well, you know, I, I've seen I've seen you know d different levels of um, participation. You know, the board like like in any other industry, boards work. You know, differently in different situations. Some boards, some boards, you know, get involved in in the day to day stuff, um, and some boards um, come once a month and and um, and uh, uh, spend you know three hours, and if everything's going fine, and that that's really the extent of it. Um, but I'll, I'll 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 tell you when I went when I got involved in the one electric company. Um, there was board, there was board members in the office all the time, and and you know asking the employees to do things. And so I went to a meeting, uh, and I said, if you want me to do this, if you want me to try to fix this, you have to let me run your co-op, and 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 I'm accountable to you. There's no doubt about it. But but I, it's it's very difficult. Um, because they went through they went through a, uh, a management transition um, in that case with uh, five or six key people there was a lot of there were some employees still loyal to to um, to the to the old manager and some of the old boards the board went through a transition it was a total change and and um, some some people accept change and some don't so um, if you want to hire an individual to 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 run it. You have to give them, you know, a chance to survive and give them control, you know, and and and, and, and monitor their success or lack of thereof. And it worked out; it was fine. They understood, um, and and uh, so so it worked out fine. Um, we went through a we went through a really tough time. There were 15 board members. We went through an extremely rough time, litigation by litigation, and um, but um, you know it worked out for them. They 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 got a co-op back that was some. Um, you know, workable, very, very <coughs> Does the subsidiary for the wind turbines ice, ice, in effect isolate the liability to the, to the main um, company? No. Does not? No. The RUS, the RUS uh, made sure um, that um, that uh, the, the, you know, they, they loaned, they loaned the wind company $9.5 million. There's a, there's a purchase power contract between the wind company and the co-op. And and that's where they that's where they kind of guarantee their their payment from. So that, that's that's the bond. Um, you know, the idea of a big payer co-op out here makes a lot of sense. However, there are two very significant obstacles. Number one, you have to have a willing seller, and number two, there has to be a price that's reasonable. And right now, we don't have either. Now, the options we have is what ratepayers on the mainland have, and that is using the PUC regulatory process. And this is why we are having these workshops, that we as the ratepayers have to get intimately involved with the restructuring of the company, 
which is in the process of, uh, right now. And secondly, get intimately involved in the next rate case, which will come up at the end of this year, Barbara, or next year. Uh, that's, that's where we <coughs> have to say. Fuel storage issues, are your tanks below or above ground for the backup generation? There's one, yep, there's one tank and it's, uh, <clears throat> it was just put in about, it was, we, we, we have to rebuild our substation. The generator, the diesel generator is right by the substation, the only substation on the island. We rebuilt, we rebuilt it in um, 2009, one because it was old and two because it, we needed extra capacity for the wind farm. And, um, and and while we did that, we replaced that tank. It's a double wall tank with a uh, with a with a, with a safety safety um, uh, vault, yeah. And, and, and it's the same the same with the uh, the transformers in the substation now. There, so there's a talk of putting them up above ground. They are above ground. It is above ground. It is above ground. So you're mandated to put them. You're mandated to put them above ground. I th I think that's what the environmental department found acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Especially with all that rock. I, I, I don't know whether there was a legal test, but we're just, I'm not sure. So do your rates contain, uh, do they fluctuate with the cost of fuel? Do the what? Do your rates fluctuate with the cost of fuel? They do. Okay. They do. Yeah. Of course do. You know, but it's a little bit more stable with a wind farm because it's generating right. so much of our electricity. Yeah. But, um, but when, when you were talking about that period where you had to use so much fuel. Yes. Yeah. You know, you worry about a time like that. Yeah. Of course. So they had much higher rates that month, that the month you were using, they... They did. You're absolutely right. Because we had to pass them through. Yeah. I did get some insurance uh, recovery, which I which we netted against the uh, both the, the cost of the, the repairs and, 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 and the fuel charge. Yeah. Can I rephrase my question? Oh, sure. <laughs> What can this island do to best prepare for being the most effective during the process, the PUC regulatory process? Get involved. Yeah. Go to meetings. Go to the town council. Determine what the issues are. There are several issues, and we've identified them at the Electric Utility Task Group. And we, as ratepayers, have to be actively engaged in this process. And it, the, the process is, Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, there's BIPCO, there's a PUC, and there's a town council. We don't have an advocate as a ratepayer other than the town council. Well, we have to do well, the attorney general. <coughs> <is the right. coughs> well, what about a generation of a wind farmer? They had two farms that already down in Dusty. That's already been. Uh, That's done in Dusty. The, 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 the uh, purchase yeah. power agreement with. Uh, yeah. That's what you see. With the yeah. yeah. does, well, the, does the inclusion of the, the uh, coax cable and the internet and all that complicate the whole process, or is that going to be entirely different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mean the fiber optic? The fiber optic. Right. That's another entity we've got to deal with. Yeah. Right. But the yeah, but that that doesn't involve the PUC and uh, and the broadband. That's a separate. Okay. That doesn't impact the region. Again, a naive question: Where does solar fit into this in terms of Block Island? Maybe we have more solar than you have in Maine. I don't know. How, is again, it's about negotiating how you, what's generated fits into the rating system. I mean, well, that gets into the whole issue of net metering. Yeah, yeah. Especially for residential yes. solar. Uh, we've true. got solar array right here. Thanks, I know. <laughs> we've got it at the school, we've got it at the fire barn, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the uh, rescue squad. It depends who's controlling the, the rate structure. Do you have yes. net metering going on in your system right now? We do, we do. And, and, and basically, net metering is mostly um, situations where people will put um, put on rooftop solar and and um, they file an application um, and we go inspect it um, and when it's done we go we, we put a meter on which goes which which can which can go both ways 
and and um, so so if you use if you use let's say 200 kilowatt hours in your house and you generate 100, you only pay for 100. Okay, and and um, and that's pretty much all the same. There is a limit. Um, for, for, for first, um, I think for public power entities such as the co-op, um, it's, it's, it's not required to accept net metering. Um, uh, but I think sometime in the past, before I was there, the, the co-op did. So we have, I think we have um, <coughs> maybe 15 installations, people that have the people that have solar panels, um, and there's a limit. I, I think it cannot exceed. Um, 1% of your peak load, the total, the total solar load, and that metering load. So I think we're getting very close to that. Um, and um, the objection to it is, um, I think we're all for, you know, the technology of solar energy. It's great, but, but what it does is um, it costs. Um, it not only it not only decreases the energy bill, the energy component of your bill. It, it, when, it, when it nets, it, 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 it eliminates the T and D portion of your bill. So, so where you, I don't want to get too complicated with rate design, but you know, you, you set your rates up based <coughs> on um, uh, an anticipation of so, so, so many sales, um, uh, kilowatt hour sales, uh, and, and, and that's how you collect sufficient revenues to pay for your power costs and pay for, your, for the money to run the company. When, when you have, when you, if you have a significant amount of meters just going backwards, you're not getting, you're not getting paid for each one. And and um, and my my thought would be to um, net the, uh, it would take two meters to do this, but net the, uh, the power part of it, but but leave the team the, you know, the, 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 the don't net the cost that you're willing to to to, to run it. <coughs> Because if it if it gets way out of control, um, the rates go up for all the other people that don't have that don't have you know solar energy. Um, but but um, I don't think anybody's won that argument anywhere <laughs> in any state. So I know I know I know two states: Vermont is the same way, and, and, and Maine is the same way, and uh, they um, they haven't they haven't prevailed on that argument. What some companies have done. Is they significantly try to increase their customer charge, you know, their fixed charge, where sometimes it's fifteen dollars or seven dollars or twenty. So to get it up, get it high enough, or at least you're recovering part of that 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 uh, that uh, revenue that you're that they're getting out of the metering process. But yes, we do have this. Yeah. <coughs> One thing, unless the cable is uh, hooked up to the mainland, Bitco will have to comply with the net metering policies of the mainland and national grid, mm -hmm. and so that they will not be exempt, which they are today. Yeah. Uh, well, BIPCO is not exempt now. BIPCO has a voluntary net metering policy that the PUC approves every year. And as of right now, it is the same as the state policy with one important exception, which is the state policy allows you to roll your consumption from month to month and trues up at the end of the year, and BIPCO requires a, a monthly true up. But other than that, the policies are the same. So there is a, a policy in effect. It's, it's voluntary, but it's been, BIPCO's had this for years. Um, but when, it, when when the cable goes in and the restructuring in the new rate case takes place, it's, it's likely that that will change to be the same as the mainland policy, because it's really not a there will be a justification at that point for the difference. The other thing is I think a lot of people need to, or not a lot of people, people have looked at solar based on the historical rates of BIPCO, which are very, very high, right? When you're paying 40 or 50 cents a kilowatt hour, investing in solar looks like a really, really good idea. And it is a really good idea. But now that we're on the, the cusp of um, having the cable go through and our rates changing, it probably makes sense to wait and see what rates are going to look like before, when you're making that kind of decision, because the, the payoff is going to be very different if you're paying 20 cents a kilowatt, not that we're going to pay 20, 30 cents a kilowatt hour rather than 40 or 45 or something like that. So. That, that um, puts rates as the important issue in the, in the 
residents' money rather than using renewable power. Okay, if, if that's an important factor for yes. you, you want to think about that. If you don't care whether you earn your but investment tax, then you're right. But I wanted to say further, if you had a co-op system where everybody who is on the, um, in the membership mm -hmm. is a member, then whether you provided some of your power by your own solar and some of your power through your company, or whether you provided all of your power through your company, possibly that unfair shift to the non-solar people wouldn't happen. If you were all members in a co-op, you should be spreading the pain as well as the gain. That's true. Yeah. Well, that's true. But there's also some, too, to, uh, grid connected solar, there are also some benefits. Yes. That's not just detriments that, that your cost and the rest of the rate pay or something. Yeah. Because there are certainly uh, 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 all throughout the country uh, increasing solar because of those advantages of back having a, a cushion. And uh, when, there, when, when there's a, uh, it can help eliminate brownouts and, and, and stuff like uh, on that nature. So there's not, it's not as directly. Uh, uh, you know, a good, a good and bad situation there. Uh, I do, I do agree that at some point, uh, if you are net metering, there, uh, like you're saying, there should be a cost for the transmission. That, that that's not, a, that's not unfair depending yeah. on the system and, and how it's set up. But in, and 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 we're finding like some things we've told in the past, like maybe three percent the saturation would be the max for solar. Or in other places now we're finding that's not true. They can have 20, 30 percent depending on how your system is set up. And uh, so there's a lot of um, a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of new technology out there that's that's able to uh, do all kinds of things you haven't thought of. You know? But if you have 30, 30 you know, 20 to 30 percent saturation with solar in a system, um, you're definitely going to have some great problems. You know, if you have you know if you well, have, if you have that meter, you can have that set up. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. mm -hmm. yes. a lot of places have done that. You know. Uh, um, Certain other islands have had even more than that, you know, and are successful. And what we're, what we're looking at now to complement the wind farm is is a solar farm. And and um, and I've I've talked to two uh, companies that you know that, that build them. And and uh, and what what and and. and I've just gone through the second one, and I thought the second one got a problem, and that is that you just um, you just can't go out um, and plunk down uh, a megawatt of solar and say, okay, um, you know, I'm done with it. Because in our situation, we have we have uh, we have a system uh, that, that peaks at, 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 uh, at uh, 2,400 kW or 2.4 megawatts. And we have four and a half megawatts of, uh, of wind, which 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 generates far more electricity in the winter than we need in less of the summer. But solar generates electricity 12 months a year. It's not it's not even. And and what, more in the summer than the winter. Yep. Yeah, and what I have to be, which is good, but 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 now you're stacking on in the winter um, all this new generation, this new solar generation, on top of what the wind turbines are generating. And, and what, I'm, what, I, what I can't convince people of is that you do not want to get yourself in to a situation where you're hugely exposed to the market, where you're relying on the market, where your customers are using very little of the next, you know, the solar, the solar layer of generation, and uh, in the winter, and now you're selling a lot of a lot of um, wind wind generation to the system, and now you're now you're stacking on top of that a lot of solar. Um, because then um, you're rel you're relying on the market. Um, uh, so so my point is, if, the, if it costs you nine cents a kilowatt hour to build it, um, and the market's three cents, you don't want to you don't want to be you know you don't want to be in, a, in in the market um, trying trying to sell all that. So you have to be very careful. You don't overbuild. What's the difference of where you are between winter production and summer production of solar? I'm not? sorry. What's the, what's the differential between your winter production and summer production of solar? Because it should be, in as far north as you are, that should be significant. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. What's the capacity of the cable? Uh, 20 megawatts. Oh, so it's quite large. Yeah, they, 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 when I wasn't involved in it, but I, but I think when they, um, when they built it, they had, uh, uh, they had, they had the anemometers already up on, on the wind site. 
So they, they, they anticipated or, or uh, a future with, with, um, with, with, with the renewable energy in it. And, 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 um, so that's, that's so what, what caused the fire? Hmm? What caused the fire? Oh, well, the winter of um, 14, uh, the, 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 the submarine cable comes up on this, on this uh, uh, peninsula that goes out. It's called Crabtree Point. And it, it goes under a beach, it goes under a road, um, the single, the single, and then it goes into a vault. And it's in marshland, saltwater marsh. And, and it was so cold, we think, this is our theory, that even the, the thoroughfare, this is a thoroughfare that separates the two islands. And they had to bring the Coast Guard cutter in to split the ice up. It's, it's, I, I don't think it had frozen over in, in you know, I don't know, 50 years. Yeah. And um, and the whole thing froze over. It's quite wide, and and, um, and and ice got in that vault, and there was tidal changes. So so the ice was moving. You know the wires come up like this. The wires that come, they, they come up like this from the other side, and the ice they were ice, the ice was kind of moving. The tide as the tide changed, the ice was moving up and down, and and pulling pulling on the cable. And you don't have to have much of a short with um, uh, 34,000 volts, um, you know, to break a flash, and, and that's that's our theory. Wow. That's our theory. Just the, just because it was so cold, and probably in prior years it never frozen um, as as the thoroughfares never frozen. And then, can I also ask, is one of the differences between wind and solar, apart from the seasonal differences, that wind is owned and distributed by a co-op or a company? Whereas it's assumed that solar is owned by the person whose roof it was on. No, in a, in a, no, in the. Um, well, I know I'm not on the solar farm, but but in general that. Um, it could be. It could be. That, so that the metering is set up to give back to an individual or take rather than. Well, I think, <laughs> I think I think it just so happens that solar. It's easier for more manageable for individuals to put up than wind. I think yeah, that's why yeah, you see more of it. It makes a difference to the way the rate structure. Yeah, if, if but companies. Part of what you all use is seen to be yours, whereas the rest of what you use is taken from the common pool. Right, right, and, and and that's why that's why I think it would be better if there's savings um, in in a in a, in a co-op solar farm yeah. to to build it for the for the benefit of everybody. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I mean, I'm thinking yes. of other places like China or somewhere like that, where it, in Beijing the heat was on in October when it wanted or not. Yes. You know, it's, it's, mm. it, it, it's, I'm not saying we, we couldn't give that amount of control to a company, but we're talking about that makes quite a difference to the way you work out your metering and part of it. It is supposed to be your own, and mm -hmm. part of it is supposed to be common. Right. It's, it's but there's a there's a lot of different types of entities that build so there's, there's developers. Yeah. Um, so there's the, colleges. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, we work with colleges. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, here we are. Um, I'll volunteer my roof if the municipality wants to put a panel on it. Um, I think. Part of the answer to your question, mm -hmm. what might lie in this, yeah. in Rhode Island, and I'm not sure if this is a federal law, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if, if, if Maine is subject to this also, but in Rhode Island, at least, the power company cannot be both a generator of power yes. and a distributor, which is probably why you created that subsidiary mm -hmm. to own the turbine. Actually, right? actually, um, or, actually um, years ago, um, <clears throat> Some some strong proponents of letting letting co-ops in Maine have their own jet. Maine's been deregulated, so so in general uh, utilities can't own generation. But these people got through special legislation with the idea, anticipation of, of the co-op building a wind farm. So the co-op has has got an exemption from that. From that, um, from that legislation, and, and uh, specifically, so they could go out and, and have their own generation. The, the the subsidiary was was formed basically to to take take uh, advantage of tax benefits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
maybe it's just me, but I get the feeling that the anomaly of this issue, I mean, there are so many facets to the issue of how, what the rate should be and, and regulation. I, I sometimes feel like I'm blindfolded and trying to figure out what an elephant looks like. Here, there are so many issues to this, you can't expect individual taxpayers like us to come in and say something intelligent for every issue. There's just too many. Is there a way of compartmentalizing these issues so that a, a small set of people can get together and become instant experts on just one issue? Because I don't see how we can all ask intelligent questions on every issue. It's just very complicated. Well, I, I guess you know, the first issue is um, can can you can you take advantage of can you can you can you get the advantages of having having the cable right at your back door on the substation and and um, because that has um, that has a, a you know a financial a financial advantage uh, and um, and and is the is the um, utility is your utility willing to 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 allow will your utility do that? Will, will they will they will they um, will they let the let the diesel generators go and 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 and, and, and provide electricity to, 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 to the island through through the cable? They don't want to let the, the diesel generators go. And that's one of the issues I have right now. How many do they need? Do they need them? And if so, how many? How long to test them? How much capacity do they need? How much fuel do we need to be buying? These, these are all, each one is a separate issue. It's complicated. But is there a way of getting a handle on this? Is there some kind of energy consultants that we should be working with who do nothing but become enmeshed in these problems and can educate us? I mean, it's hard for our, our own homegrown task force, which has done a hell of a job, to become instant experts on every issue. So how do we become instant experts so we can ask intelligent questions and kind of know the answers before we ask them? I, 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 thought, I thought on the boat coming over that um, I guess I, I, I got a hint of the idea that there's an argument that, um, that even, if you, even if you connect it to the mainland, um, that uh, that um, there still wouldn't be uh, a price advantage for you versus versus continuing on the diesel generators. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, when the cable goes in, Bitco will, will no longer be allowed to own generation under the Rhode Island regulation, but they've asked for a waiver. Yep. to keep the generation, the diesels, to use as backup. And that has led to a question of whether they should also be allowed to take advantage of making the capacity available in the capacity market, as you do, mm -hmm. at $50,000 a year, which has led to a further question, which I would like to know what happens in, in Fox Island, mm -hmm. whether if they take advantage of <coughs> making the capacity available, are they required to generate if called upon by ISL? So BIPCO is going to keep the generators for backup purposes, but it's still unclear how and when and how, how often they would be allowed to run. On an economic basis, probably very low because the cost of generation from the diesels is so high. The reason, the, the price that we'll pay for generation <coughs> once the cable goes in will be based on power contracts with the mainland. It won't be based on the diesel generation at all. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, um, you know, three years ago we were projecting real 40% savings in aggregate on average from the cable going in, and that differential has dropped probably to maybe 10% or 15% because the price of oil has come down so much. Yeah, but so I that's think, what the. But I think that the prices, the prices of electricity that you buy on the market are going to come down too. But not as much. Uh, and in uh, fact, in the winter time, I think there's a, the constraint of this is getting a little off topic, but there's constraints in natural gas supply that tend to push those prices up in the winter. They pretty much dealt with that. Okay. Last, just just by example, 
in 2014, um, you were selling, we were, you were selling wind power in the market for $140, mm -hmm. and now it's now it's down to about $33 a megawatt hour. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it, I, I don't know whether there's a direct correlation with the, you know, with, with the price per barrel of oil and, and, and what the energy rates are, but it'd be interesting to look at. But when the cable goes in, we, we won't be, our generation price won't be based on the diesels, it'll be based on right. whatever power companies right. we have at the main Now, yeah. do, you, do, you, are you, do you know, are you required to sell backs if called upon? Because you're in the capacity markets, do you also have to sell them? We're, 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 we're required to, um, to run the diesel generators if ISO asked us. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the other option is that um, if there's a strain, um, uh, in, in the in the uh, in the available available capacity, then, then we can run. But that's optional. That's optional. So I th I think the rule is if you don't, then they'll penalize you. But um, we we don't we don't have um, we don't have a a central dispatch you know department and, and you know we're not wired to monitor um, you know the ISO the ISO needs. So we're living we're living in the world where if they call us. You know, we can get something up there in 15 minutes just to start it up. So, and does that happen? Um, it happened once last fall that I got a call, um, and um, they they said the conditions are that if you run it, it would be an advantage, a financial advantage, and, and the guys went up and started. But that's the only time in eight years that um, that, that it's happened. And how long were they on for? They were on for about an hour. Yeah, maybe 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 an hour and a half. But you still get that fifteen thousand credit regardless of whether we do. We, we we get we get that just for virtually having them available. And and, and and again we have to test them twice a year. We have a summer test and a winter <laughs> test. And we can still run them for our own emergency situations. And is that an offset? Is it, when you say credit, is that that an offset to a capacity charge that you owe? No, so? no, it's not. No. Okay. What we what what did happen is um, in, in in July of 2014, um, the capacity charges are set by ISO when 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 um, ISO peaks. So so whatever your whatever your contribution that capacity is, that's how they allocate the cost to you, and that's how they set your charge. But for some for some strange reason, in July 23rd of 14, when ISO peaked, the the turbines were running really strong and wiped out our capacity allocation. And there's such see you, if you so so that was great. This ne this next year, uh, not so lucky. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I think I think they were running, but not to the extent you know four and a half megawatts or whatever it is. So. <laughs> So you can use you can use the turbines as a as a unfortunately you can't make the wind blow so you don't want you know you can't you can't force them to run when it peaks but um, but that would coincidentally that happened in 14. It sounds like you've had a pretty successful experience. The transition to a co-op has been very positive mm -hmm. for your location, but with really not a lot of significant problems. But it, looking back on it. Is there anything that you can think of that you wished you had predicted or had arranged for ahead of time? I'm, I'm thinking, is there anything you would advise us to be particularly cautious about in starting in this process? Um, not really. I, I think I think that um, I, I guess I guess you know the advice I would give is to get your ducks in a row uh, and, and 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 participate. Um, I, I I I guess I don't yet understand how willing your power company is to to not oh, only to willing to 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 put to put the diesel generators into reserve mode. And then, and then enter into enter, you know, and then start receiving um, uh, power from the mainly approved cable. I, I, that, that, I, that, I'm not sure I understand where that's the, at. The, 
the, the actual electricity that's consumed on the island will come primarily from the wind farm. Okay. Because that will feed from here. Yeah. And then to the and then from here to the mainland. To the extent that the wind farm is not generating sufficient electricity, we would then purchase from the mainland. And who's buying the who's buying the power? The National Grid has a Deepwater Wind has a contract with National Grid to sell all of the power at twenty four cents. At twenty four cents to so all of the twenty four cents. How much? Twenty four cents. Twenty four and a half. Twenty four and a half cents to let out. Going a going up 50 a year, but that's between deep water and national grid. That's not our price. Our price for electricity will be set based on contracts that BIPCO, the power company, enters into with mainland power Okay. So BIPCO has now um, hired a company called en uh, Energy New England. Oh, yeah. It's a consultant that, board, you know. that um, helps with that too, mm -hmm. so that yep. they can. Enter into contracts for power, and that's what our that's what our electricity, our energy, the energy portion of our bill will be based on. Mm -hmm. So we, yes, they're not they're not planning on running the generators to provide. Okay. So so going power. from energy to renewable, you're you're going to be getting market based. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's Barbara, how does that component work if the power is coming from a wind farm to us? And being distributed here. Just the electronic yeah, side. Just, yeah, the thing about it is two different flows. Yeah. One is an electronic flow mm -hmm. and one is a money flow. Okay. And they're separate, right? They're, the electrons flow through Block Island and it's like water. It'll fill the Block Island bucket and then whatever's left is, goes to the mainland. But grid is paying 24 and a half cents a kilowatt hour for the whole thing, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And then we pay. Well, for whatever we use, mm. but not based on the 24 cents, but based on what we contract with um, the main, that, based on the water contracts that just come and use So they're two totally separate flows. And where does our uh, plant expense and our infrastructure expense come in? Come so from BIPCO or from the national grid? No, from the Okay, so the fixed portion of it, the overhead wires, the office, the meters, mm -hmm. all of that will remain dip codes. Yeah, and those right. portions of the bill might change a little bit, especially when they have a rate case, but that part of it's essentially not changing in this. It's just uh, the generators. So where the electricity, the generation costs and supply. Unless we go through a major upgrade. Well, then the right. Like if we upgraded the distribution system, Right, but that has nothing to do with the wind farm or where our generation comes from. Those, that would be a separate. That's just the rate case right. business. Right. It sounds like all the wind farms doing for you is, is giving you access to the main. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Basically. And now, so now you're going to be, however they negotiate the contracts, you're going to be living pretty close to market market rates. Right. Right. Yeah. And with the added environmental benefit of not having to run the, jet, the diesels yeah. on island, so there's a lot of benefit. And you know, that was a big factor um, in, in, in the Fox Islands uh, wind project, is that um, a lot of people supported the project, not just financially, but for environmental mm -hmm. reasons. And that was, a, that was a big, a big uh, consideration going into it. And, and Black Island, in the same way, we'll be able to say we get our electrons from the wind, because yeah. you know, most of it will be supplied by the wind farm. Yeah. And also the fiber optics. And yes, the fiber as well. So we could, as Lockdown, actually uh, get a group of people together and uh, uh, and form our own co-op and buy the power company, and that's very possible. That's There's a couple of barriers. The barrier is <laughs> they have to be willing to sell, and right. they have to be willing to sell at a reasonable price. <laughs> okay. and both of those do not exist as of today. I'm just curious, I know there are noise regulations. Um, are there also noise regulations for low frequency waves emitted by turbines? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. So does um, Fox Island, do you, you must go through the same process of negotiating power contracts for the 40% or so that you said? We use, we, yeah, we use, um, 
We're not actually a member of ISO directly because um, we're so small that um, we use an entity very very much like Energy New England. We use, it's called the Vermont Public Power Supply Association, authority, excuse me, authority. And, and, um, and the wind turbines are registered in their name because, because they're, they're a member of ISO and they're, and they're selling the excess in, in, into the ISO market. And then, and then basically we, we buy and sell as we need, um, we buy as we need um, through, through the short term spot market. Um, and that goes every, every 15 minutes it changes. Now you can, you can go out and hedge, and I have hedged in the past. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes when we look at a kind of a rough market, an unpredictable market, we'll hedge, we'll hedge the peak load for the summer, um, for July and August, because we worry about, you know, the demand goes up so high, the price issue um, um, that, uh, that uh, we want to protect, protect our customers. The last couple of summers, um, that hasn't happened because the market is so low. Um, so, so um, I have I have a few economists who believe that it's including one one of one of which is a regulator that believes that living on the short term market is much better than buying into the long term. Market. So you, you really you don't have any long term contracts? Just just with the wind company. Just for selling, not for. No, we buy, I'll, I'll explain the relationship. The, 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 the co-op has a contract with a wind company to buy 100% of its output and at 100% at a, at a cost of service. So, so, so all that, pump, the, all that, all that um, power comes to the co-op and then, and then what the co-op uses, it uses, and then what it doesn't use, it sells okay. to the ISO. And we sell that to them. We do we do sell the recs out of state um, um, to Massachusetts. We don't we don't Maine does not have um, uh, first uh, first class recs any requirement for public power entities to buy them. So we sell we sell 100% of them out of state. And then when we buy we we uh, we, it, it, we we automatically. I said, um, the VEPSA has it set up so automatically when we need power, we, we're getting it off the spot market. Unless you hedge. <clears throat> but but we haven't we haven't decided other than this couple of the summer months with a low peaking to hedge any other, any other time of year. We certainly don't have to hedge in the winter because we have more than more than we need. Right. So I think yes. I heard you say that you uh, so you have an excess capacity, say, in the winter, and you sell it. And I think I heard you say you sell it at a higher price than what you would it cost you to buy it in the, sum, in the, in the summer. Yes. And why is that? Why is the price? Because, because it, well, this, this is just recently. But in the last, in the la in 2013, 14, in the winter of 15, um, there were uh, restrictions on the transmission to get natural gas to Maine. So so they went, they went, it's like this is what they told me, they went to to uh, heating, heating use, what they could get versus running generators. So the price just went through the ceiling. Not so much the price of the commodity, but the, the, the price of the transmission. Not so much now. Um, the prices have come down. They've, they've adjusted. They've made all sorts of adjustments so the prices have come down. But in the past three winters, it's been like that. Prior, prior to so it wasn't really just a seasonal thing. It was, it was had to do with it was a market term. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now it's pretty much even, which is fine. Yeah. Which is fine. As long as it doesn't get hugely expensive in the summer and really, really cheap in the winter. So how long has your co-op existed? Since 1975. Um, 41. 41 years. 25 and 16. And how did it really start? It started, I think, um, with um, a bunch of a bunch of people being concerned about, well, you know, this could be a, a, a mirror thing about about the diesel generators in town, mm -hmm. about the reliability of those generators, and I think probably the reliability of the distribution system in itself. 
and and um, and they, they met the requirements to to participate in the REA. At that time, it's the REA programs, and and um, and the other the other the other attraction was two percent money at the time. They <laughs> formed their board, and they could go to Washington and get that. Yes. Yeah. 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 And they and they and they formed a you know membership a membership elected board, and then. Um, so it was a grassroots effort on the part of the community to to really. It was. That's just going. It was. I wasn't there, but I'm from you know, from what I've heard. But also but, there was yeah. a willingness of the private. Yes. Yes. The That's private company yes. yes. so, right. yeah. And the, right. well, they had a company that couldn't couldn't you know, couldn't provide high electricity. So <laughs> so. Um, I mean, they, I, I, I read something about they had the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, flying in generator parts, and, and it was, I guess, you know, they only had electricity half the time, and and you know, when somebody went to the owner and said, you know, we'll give you some money to get you out of this, and there's your willing seller. So. And the town was never the town of Haven was never involved in any of that. Well, they didn't want to run it. To, I, th I think I think that politically they were. But not, but not, not, um, not financially. I think, I think, I think a lot of the people, a few of the people that were um, pushing it were, 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 you know, select selectmen. Um, yeah. So the town never wanted to run the co-op. I don't think so. I don't think so. Can we go back to legal barriers to our? Well, in, in um, the early 90s, a group of us were researched having the Block Island Power Company be purchased by a uh, co-op. And uh, we went down to Washington. We met with the National Association of Rural Electric Utilities. <coughs> we were quite interested in it because... The national, the, is that the CFC or is that the NRACA? NRACA. Okay, yeah. uh, and um, they're quite interested because there's no... Uh, uh, co-ops in Rhode Island um, and um, or Connecticut. It's all investor-owned utilities, mm -hmm. except for the Pascot Fire District, and <laughs> which is more operated like a muni. And um, we found out that there's a 1920s state law that prohibits electric utility co-ops. <laughs> and so they hired a lobbyist to actually go and, you know, spend a couple thousand bucks on it. And he met with the leaders of the House and the Senate. And they, you know, looked over what we need to do and what other legislation in other states look like to let this do. And then they came back and said, good luck trying to get this through the state legislature with National Grid opposing it. And, uh, so, and, and the number of representatives and, and uh, senators that they have supporting them. And, the, and uh, so the result was, for a small place like Block Island, it didn't really have any statewide benefits, it would be almost impossible to get that. So it's a federal restriction? Or no, it's a state. It's in the a 1920s state law that um, uh, prohibits uh, electrical, electrical utilities not being owner, uh, uh, not being, sorry, um, you know, investor owned and operated. I've heard that challenge, though, and I've also heard that, that uh, there's been talk about going back and having legislation change, but just uh, targeting it to Block Island uh, uh, because that would then eliminate national grids of concern about other co ops uh, starting up. So there are, there are advocates there. I sure. And I think that's correct. I mean, I think if, if we were to say if you could crowd legislation, just like the Costco legislation, is very, very specific to the creation of the Pasco Utility District. The problem, again, goes back to what Phil said earlier, you need to have a willing partner in BIPCO for that to happen. And that was the other part of the conversation 20 years ago, was that if the power company isn't willing to be bought by a co-op, it's just it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the power company's that's, that's the been for sale a half a dozen times, meaning buyers have come and we know who they are, a number of, of uh, other rural utilities that are, were interested in the power company came down and they um, 
did due diligence and spent tens of thousands of dollars, you know, going over the park and these books and everything, and they could never reach an agreement uh, with the owners of the park on, the, on, a, on a reasonable price. Yeah. So, and this has happened a number of times in the last 20 years. Hmm. But if you're, but if you're, if you're getting power at market rates. Then what are what are what are the other issues? What what, what would be what would be your what would be your other? Well, the distribution problems? system on the island is only two k for uh, voltage, and so I mean and 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 um, so the associated losses with that are in the tens, you know, of percent. So people have been talking about upgrading it to forty one sixty or some other reasonable. Yep. Voltage and the power company up till now has not wanted to make the investment, even though studies show that it would pay for itself in four or five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it don't, it don't say that do it for them. Yeah. Okay. But this is the first time we've ever been on this doorstep. Well, I think things are going to change a lot in the next two years. I hope so. And in the legal issue you're referring to, you use the word co-op, is that to considered the same as the municipality, no. so that if the municipality bought no, the power in, company in, this, in the same way as it owns the water in, and sewer, the, yeah, um, and For electric utilities, there has to be special legislation because of the 1920s law. And right. has so the fire so district to get it, they would be considered the same under the law in the same way. That's right. Yeah, okay, thank you. So you would need, just like Pasco needed that. Legislation to create the yeah. Pasco Utility District. You need to do that for one yeah. towns. Well, we've certainly gone through that process at the state level for our taxes for land trust and for mm -hmm. land fees and other things. But you didn't have national really against you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, it's, it really comes down to the code, though. Cause yeah, you, of course. You need a willing son. And what, doesn't National Grid want somebody over here? We want us to be able to take care of ourselves because they really can't supply us all the time. If, if the power goes out, they don't have to take care of us. That's yeah. right. But don't but they even when the cable goes to the But don't, wouldn't, wouldn't it be in their best interest, though, to have us in any way? I don't think they care. I don't think they care. How many customers, how many customers do you have? <laughs> yeah. Where, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why these large power companies are so against um, having having you know some of these small islands um, become independent. I think it's, it's never come up. And we're, like, it's not we're, it's not a it's not a fun you know it's not a fun system to operate. Yeah. You know right now right now um, <clears throat> Swan's Island is a co-op. It's 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 up by uh, Bar Harbor and they serve the island of Swan's Island and the island of Frenchboro and and for, for multiple reasons, um, they've gotten themselves into a situation where they've kind of just given up. And, and the system is run down. They're having trouble finding um, you know, people, to, employees, uh, you know, manager alignment. And, um, uh, and, and, and their rates are high. But their rates are, I think, up in the 35 cent range. And um, so, they're going through a process with a company called Amera, which, um, if you're familiar with Maine, you see old Bangor Hydro that was bought out. But um, and um, so they're negotiating the sale, you know, going the other way, and um, and because they want lower rates, but the the price they're going to pay is that Amera has said they're not going to have alignment on the island. So when something happens, they'll go they'll go to the substation on the mainland and shut the shut shut the two islands off until until someone can get on the boat. And oh and, and as you probably all know, uh, there's some days there is no boat. There's some days if there was one, you would want to be on it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so they have a cable, they have a cable for these Swan Islands. Yes, they do, but it's old. It's it's run right down. I, I think I think what happened to them. Is that um, they they got behind on um, you know the updating updating of the electrical system and you constantly have to you know you constantly have to keep at it 
and not get yourself in a situation where all of a sudden you wake up one morning and your system is old and we have to do you know, all of it because then you get into a huge amount of money and then you get into a rate shock situation. But if you constantly you know, change things, um, and I don't know if utility has ever been perfect at that, but some are better than others. But um, I think so, so they kind of they got themselves in that situation. So now they need a couple of cables. They need um, a lot of distribution work, and and they they need to find people. And Bangor Hydro says that well we can make your rates lower, but there'll be no there'll be nobody out there. That's how they're going to save the money. I mean, you can save a lot of money by just seizing operations. You know, playing <laughs> with you know instant savings, but. Um, I don't think it's going to be comfortable for you know for the members. I think it's going to be. Um, I, I, I remember last last winter on Vinyl Haven um, was probably the worst winter that I've spent anywhere. You know, I, I mean, all those storms that went through Boston went right up right up the coast, and you know, you get two feet of snow, but the winds were blowing 50 miles an hour. I can remember walking. I couldn't see the office building coming. You know, walking down the road. It was just and and, and at night, I'd say, I hope these guys don't have to go out, you know, that there's an outage. Uh, you know, these guys have to go out and, um, and work in this stuff, because a lot of the roads you couldn't get through. So they have to go, you know, either through the snow banks or on snowshoes or something. And, and uh, But they were there in case it, in case it, you know, did occur, and they're really good at it. But to not have anybody there, and then, worse yet, to, if, if there's some, um, and, 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 you know, we're very lucky for the most part, we just have, you know, a wire break or, uh, you know, maybe a transformer fail. Um, and so you, you're not, you're not having, you know, 2,000 people lose electricity. So, but, but if they weren't there, somebody would go from Central Maine Power, or I mean, from Bangor Island and, and pull, pull the switch to the whole island until, you know, you can get some of them. But if it, I, I don't know, it just doesn't work in my mind. Well, what's your winter population? Uh, probably between the two islands, 1,500. Yeah. How many meters it goes? To, uh, there's there's 2,000 meters. Yeah. How many do we have? Six, seven, eight hundred. Yeah. 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 But we now definitely are in that situation that you were talking about about that other company, but having a distribution system. It's not wonderful. It's not as bad as it used to be. I mean, yeah. all of a sudden they woke up and said, well, maybe we need to do something. So mm -hmm. it's not as bad as it used to be. But we, they had some consultants out here, and the people did some of their first line readings and called the company and said, oh, there's something mm -hmm. wrong with our equipment. You need to send us other equipment. And then uh -huh. they talked to one of the FITCO people, and he said, no, those are the right numbers. Uh -huh. Something wrong with your equipment. Any other questions of Tim? What does the cable cost? What's that? What What's the um, the cable? Yeah. The cable cost. I think. Um, I think it was six million, and it was a two and a half million. It was a two point five million dollar grant. Oh, okay. And what's the distance to the mainland? 11, 11 miles. That was in 2005. Yeah. Yeah. Where does it go? Rockland. Rockland. Just, just, um, just north of Rockland. Yeah. If you go up the coast, there's a little, there's a little um, place called Lincoln. It's uh, and and uh, Lincoln is actually in the water where it goes down into. So it's between Rockland and Rockland. Yeah. It's up on a hill. Which is a big hill. I mean, my understanding of the whole situation was definitely helped. Yes, yes. yes. I think Peter made a good comment. This is pretty complex stuff for just my people. And I, and I sit on the uh, electric utility task group with Barbara and Everett, and a lot of times when they're talking about these details, my eyes just close. <laughs> well, I think you've made it very much clearer. Well, thank you. Then uh, <clears throat> certainly I've understood. Well, no, I really, I think if you get through the, you know, if you if you can if you can get a power source other than the diesel generators, and and, and you can you can live on the market, and energy and Energy New England is a very good organization, by the way, um, and um, 
you know, and if they can, if they can negotiate um, uh, financially positive contracts, then then you're probably going to see an improvement. You know, you know, versus what you have now. So, 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 um, if that if that all happens, that's 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 good. So, are you saying if we formed a core group and we engage Energy New England to negotiate? No, I don't know. Oh, we be engaged. But but you know you can you can ask I think your power company to have um, you know public meetings, information meetings, um, and just tell you what's going on. Can't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry. We, we do yeah. have the, the PUC. This is the second. You're the second person who's come. We had the PUC came and spoke with us. Uh, a couple yeah. months ago, in October maybe, yeah. and the, the um, attorney who started reading that walked, I don't know if anyone here was at that, but she walked through the entire process of the restructuring and the rate case and so on and so forth. And they've offered to come back out again. And they've been having meetings with Rock Island Power to sort of lay this out, which are open to the public. And the town has, um, Nancy's attended them. Yeah. I've been to one, Evershore goes to them. So it is a public process. There's there's nothing about it that's not public. And um, the, the meetings are usually noticed. And, and I know Cindy wasn't fire, so she'd be more than happy to come out again, again and, and go through this kind of thing with us. But she also was noticed his face. Well, that was in the paper. Yeah, it was just about the paper. Oh, small. And then the EUTG meets once a month, yeah. and these topics are always on our agenda, and we would look forward to more people from the public coming to those meetings. And Cindy was going to try to arrange at some point to have the representative from Energy New England uh, come out and explain their whole operation. Uh, Did you get to participate in that? Oh, yeah. 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 I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to comment on Peter's question before. Uh, it, and I, I was unable to make the first meeting where the PUC was here. But uh, I just like to encourage the uh, electric energy test group to, uh, I think we, uh, the citizens, rely a lot on the guidance uh, that you can offer us as ratepayers uh, and to continue doing so and as, uh, having these uh, meetings and, uh, because I think they're very informative but I think that you as we look at you, uh, your group as professionals and at least you're more, more informed than most of us and uh, just sort of put the issues before us in a uh, Easier understood fashion. And, and, if, if, trying. and if you look at the town budget, both the current year and next year, there is money in there for consultants for anyone that the EUTG feels they need to assist them in this process as we go through the next 12 months. So. Great. I, I have a question. I, I, it's because I'm, I don't know a lot about this area. Your Generators are on land. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And you have people go out to them and service them on a regular basis. Well, they they GE, GE comes twice a year and does a six month service. They do everything. Right. And and our linemen um, uh, address uh, downtime. You know shutdowns. Mm -hmm. Most of it's done from Schenectady. If they trip off for any reason. Um, they can they can mostly most of, most of the time put them on for security, reset them, but well, sometimes the guys have to go out and go into the turf, go into the tower and reset reset them. How often would this happen? Um, um, twice a month, three times a month, and and also there there could be a problem. They won't reset, and then they might have to order a part, mm -hmm. which gets there overnight, and then they a lot of times the guys will our linemen will stall them. If, if for any reason they can't, they'll fly GE in to help. And, and um, right, you have cranes on the island that they can no, be brought up. No, they have to be brought up. They, they have to be brought up. Now, as you know, we have, we have five turbines three miles out of the ocean, mm -hmm. 90 feet of water, and we have you know swells that are 
15, 20 feet on occasion. Winds, certainly hurricane force, not unusual out here. Based on your experience with the turbines there, how difficult would it be to regularly service five turbines out there? There's days I wouldn't want to do it. You know, we have turbines also um, are very sensitive to high winds. Ours will shut down, mm. I think, after 50 miles an hour. Yeah. And, and, and also, um, sometimes when the wind is very uncertain, they'll shut down. Um, they'll have tower vibration, and they protect themselves really well. They have a brain that just says, I've got to protect myself, and they'll turn, you know, they'll turn right. sideways with the wind, and right. they'll do all those things the best they can. But sometimes, um, you know, it gets ahead of them, I guess, and, and they shut down. Um, yeah, we have winds 50 miles an hour, but that's not unusual. The threshold is, uh, what did they tell me, there were six megawatt turbines? Mm -hmm. could be higher. I don't know. Yeah, no, they're at the same speed at 50. But as soon as the wind drops below 50, they start right up again. Yeah, um, exactly. That's what they're supposed to do. Right. And, and, so, and if you look at the percentage of the time that the wind's blowing over 50 miles an hour, it's in a hundredths of a percent of a year. So there are times that it blows over 50. And we remember those because all the lawn furniture blows into the hedge yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But the actual hours that the wind turbines are going to be off are, is actually only a uh, a dozen hours a year because of it. Yep. And, and we have the same, I think we have the same experience. Okay. Um, are your turbine, not that, turbines, um, are they gear based? Yes. Okay. Because ours, as I understand it, are going to be a magnetic coil that, you know, reduces some of these problems. Yep, they, they do. do. That's, that's why they went to that next technology. Yeah. Kind of. So, but yours are geared. We, yeah. <clears throat> and what kind of capacity factor again? Um, it's probably about 33 percent, I think. You, I could do the I could do the math, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the maintenance of those uh, turbines are the responsibilities of people who went, mm -hmm. not NICO or not. Yeah. yeah. How are the fees and servicing that related to the cost that we would be paying? It's, it's, it sounds to me, if I'm not wrong, that the reliability of those turbines don't have any impact upon what you're doing with that. Yeah. Okay. So, so you still have service problems, reliability problems. Much less today than years yeah. past. Yes. And that's another reason to participate in informational things with regulators. And, mm -hmm. Some have discounted the intelligence of the people in, in these chairs, and, and I don't think we should be listening to the, the questions and the quality of the questions. Uh, I think we got a pretty smart group of Block Islanders here mm -hmm. who are really interested in going forward. Okay. Very optimistic. When we, in, in the Vermont electric, when I was involved, and we got into the depth of the problem, so we had a lot of information meetings, you know, because we had to let we had to let people know, and and uh, and be, because of the past and the neglect and the situation, we uh, we had an abundance of regulation. You know, the the, the Vermont Public Service Board um, really really got involved, and I don't blame them. And we had differences of opinion as to how to resolve it. None of us, none of us there, after about a year transition, were involved in problem making. We were involved in the problem solving. We weren't there when the problems were made. So, you know, we were working together to try to, to try to resolve it. But they were holding us accountable, um, and, and, and that's that's what regulators do. So. Well, Chip, we want to thank you very much for yes. coming today and yes. some time. <laughs>